the message behind all of these. And Zysol is um, kind of the most operational or working horse code that we use in the group. There's a couple of other open source software projects that we are involved in that I will not touch upon. So this is um, how we will do the next, how we will spend the next 90 minutes together is that I will talk for about 30 minutes, give you an introduction about what Zysol is and what you can do with it. And uh, while I speak, uh, you can lean back and listen, but please uh, do also these two things if you didn't do that so far, as is visit the um, training um, GitHub page. And also make sure that you have, if you want to participate in the hands-on part, that you install Docker, because we will have, yeah, we have a Docker image, so a kind of a Zysol to go version for you to turn your uh, laptop into a small supercomputer and run some of um, two small examples that we prepared in that Docker image. So Docker um, is a little bit like a virtual machine and it's um, increasingly popular in sharing um, code and especially for training and teaching purposes. <clears throat> and um, after you install Docker, please run it. And then you can uh, pull the training image using this, uh, this command. But that's also all explained on this website. So if you follow these steps, you shouldn't, shouldn't have problems. <clears throat> all right. So the ISO core team. Um, so we basically are two groups at um, the Earthquake Physics Group at LMU, but we're closely collaborating with um, Michael Bader's group for um, scientific computing at TUM. And uh, these are just some pictures of people you might encounter if you're posting in our uh, GitHub discussion uh, website of SciSol or if you're um, trying to post an issue or a bug report or something. So one of these people might um, answer. And um, the code has been funded by um, various um, <coughs> projects specifically also um, encouraging open source software development. Uh, I have these intro slides. I'm sure you already heard that. And this is, of course, the title uh, picture of Heiner's book. But um, I go quickly um, across this again. So if you're talking about computational seismology um, and high performance computing, it's important to know that uh, seismology really has been a pioneering field for large scale computations and also has been itself pioneered by using large computers to do these kind of simulations. And why is that? Because we are data rich and also um, the equations that we solve can often be treated as linear. So for example, see who else um, doing something else, he's uh, deviating from that, but in the most standard cases in computational seismology, we're looking at linear hyperbolic PDEs, which lend themselves to be distributed on large computers. And the key activities that we talked about using also, the other codes are, of course, calculate synthetic seismograms in hopefully 3D Earth and uh, use these synthetics, for example, to solve seismic inverse problems. Um, there are uh, the common approach. I think all the codes you've seen so far in this training are time domain solutions um, of the wave equation. I don't think there was a frequency dependence over um, part of the training, if you can correct me. And you resolve this by domain decomposition, so you're splitting up um, your model domain of interest into small packages, decompose the domain um, if you parallelize these kind of codes. Ongoing challenges are, of course, 3D of structures complicated, as we know in spin, um, computational efficiency, go to higher and higher frequencies to capture smaller structures, and often we don't even know um, the complex geological subsurface at the scales we may be able to resolve. And there's a need for community solutions, so you heard about SPECFEM and AXSM. However, if you have this quote from Sean Trump, um, you could state that the forward problem for seismic wave propagation is basically solved. That's a bit of a controversial quote for spin, I guess. <laughs> um, we have other applications. I, I added this slide because um, some of you had uh, interesting um, topics, I guess, yesterday that relate to that. So this is a couple of examples um, solved with a code that's not part of the training, but that's also open source. It's a speed code um, developed in um, uh, Milano. So these plots are from a paper from Mazzieri et al. And uh, this is basically to show um, if we're trying to pitch uh, computational seismology codes to applications, for example, from engineering, we often require multi-scale and multi-physics capabilities. So for example, linking seismic wave radiation to um, um, the response of a bridge, or if you're really interested in um, soil city interactions, you um, would want to also mesh uh, these small scale buildings, for example. So um, this, is, this is interesting work that the speed group is doing um, in this um, more in engineering multiphysics applications. And there's also a lot of work done in Japan um, on, this, on this applications. 
Um, now, a couple of slides about Zeissel. <clears throat> um, Heiner already mentioned it's a discontinuous Golurkin um, numerical based on discontinuous Golurkin method. We also see that there's ADA listed here. So this is a time and equation scheme, which is a little bit um, exotic, but the method together in time and space is ADA DG. And uh, we're solving a seismic wave equation as all the other methods. <laughs> um, one specific feature is that we're using unstructured TED meshes, so tetrahedral meshes, as you can see on these um, examples here. And those lend themselves specifically for uh, having models with very complicated geometry. So for example, this is um, an, an early model we did um, <clears throat> for a computational record where we just had a point source and we're interested in modeling seismic wave propagation at the Mount Merapi volcano, accounting for the complex topography. Here's an example I think I mentioned yesterday, or that was, I also put that because it was this part of the discussion where um, this is uh, from exploration, oil exploration um, application, where the steel case is meshed here. Um, so we were interested in propagating waves too, like the thin steel case, very different wave speeds than the surrounding um, rock underground. Um, okay. So we can represent complex geometries. Uh, we do have heterogeneous media. We have um, support for a lot of different rheologies, elasticity, of course, and viscoelasticity. So Q attenuation, viscoplasticity. I mentioned that yesterday, we have this Tuga Praga plastic, uh, Fulton plasticity implemented, anisotropy, pore elasticity. Um, it's very natural to get multiphysics um, coupling into this method because we can, um, for example, to get our dynamic rupture sources into um, Sisol, we can uh, modulate the numerical flux that is used in a DG method to communicate the between elements. And this flux can be modified to just behave like a friction law. And if you want to talk about it very, um, very qualitatively. It's high order accurate. I hope uh, Heine explained what that means. And it allows um, high resolution. So it's very uh, suitable for parallel computing environments. And DG is actually um, popular for wave propagation problems. I put a couple of other um, references on this slide uh, from other groups. I have this um, short explanations of, you could argue of why um, you why we did each of these um, choices in the numerical implementation. So DG is, is not only high order accurate, it's also featuring very low numerical dispersion. We need really minimal changes for getting multiphysics implementations. When we're doing this complicated subsurface structures, we can have them intersecting, we have branching and so on. So meshing is uh, lending, this tetrahedral meshing is lending itself really for having um, physically consistent, for example, intersecting faults. And we have also very favorable um, numerical dissipation of high frequencies. <laughs> um, ADER is, um, this high order time integration. I will not talk about that much, but it basically allows us to have accurate high order accuracy in time as in space using just a single explicit time integration step. Um, and that means increasing accuracy can be really cheap if we are implementing it in a hardware aware manner. TETS, I, I talked about it a bit. We, um, this also allows, as you can see here, um, this adaptive refinement and coarsening um, into and away from regions of interest. Um, this has something to do with the flux that we choose. This is a modal formulation. And then uh, we also have a certain choice of basis function. So if you want to know, know more about that, you can ask me later. <laughs> but um, in general, the software that allows for a really rapid setup um, of realistic non planar um, for example, interactive fault systems or other complex geometries while exploiting the accuracy of a higher order numerical method. And uh, the good news is that, or one thing to mention, and good news is that um, BG causes a lot of extra flops in terms of storage required. So we have more decrease um, of freedom, more unknowns that we're solving for in terms of time to solution. But um, it can be really performed using um, computational science very fast and, and exploiting the machines that are around and um, clusters that universities have in a very efficient manner. I have a couple of slides about um, earthquake, uh, computational earthquake seismology, so this means dynamic rupture simulations. I'm aware that most of you may be not um, primarily interested in this, however, the um, um, training examples we have feature that, so I think it's important to um, quickly explain what this, what this means. So these um, are something that we call physics-based earthquake simulations. Physics-based in our sense means that we're solving of what happens at the source. 
So we're solving for um, spontaneous dynamic earthquake rupture as a, the nonlinear interaction of frictional failure and seismic wave propagation. So that means an earthquake in those simulations is really spontaneously developing propagating shear failure on a prescribed fault, um, which is a solid under compression. And um, we're using methods that are developed for wave propagation. So this is Sysol is um, uh, originally a pure wave propagation code, but we're bootstrapping solving um, earthquake for earthquake physics into this method. And um, I have a slide here, you can also look at later, but um, just explaining that very um, simply, we're basically defining earthquake dynamics as a um, internal boundary condition, or interface condition in terms of contact and friction. So it's a thin fault, so an infinitesimally thin interface that's not allowed to open. And um, the displacement discontinuity that develops during the earthquake simulation and the wave propagation simulation along this discontinuity is the slip. Out of, Alice, yeah. Jack has yeah. a question. OK, sure. Uh, hi, Alice. So just to concretize this slightly, is the um, the fault treated as a, like it's it's a separate sort of code running within the size sol code that updates the friction law according to the conditions of the wider size sol simulation and then they talk to each other through the flux in the dg method is that the right yes yeah, so it's, it's just um if you think about it it's just a, um, a choice of the source that you can turn on or off but if you do include um, a dynamic rupture source you you solve and those elements that are tagged as hosting a dynamic rupture um, interface so it's the the interface of these of two elements adjacent to each other is basically um, this boundary condition tag or this interface tag. And then on these interfaces, you solve in addition to solving the seismic wave equation, which you always solve everywhere in the domain. But on these interfaces, you additionally solve for the dynamic rupture um, yielding conditions. And that's basically a friction law. So you're checking are the shear stresses um, compared to the strength um, that's prescribed on this faults leading to slip or not, and then we're updating. If you have slip, right, we have a velocity stress formulation, so if you have slip rate, you're updating the stresses and so on. So it's a, a, spe um, a special source, basically, in the wave propagation code. But it's not um, it's not encapsulated in a sense. You're really just stepping through, um, as you would also do with a point source, but in this case, you're solving more equations on these interfaces. <laughs> OK, thank you. Taya? Hi. Hi. Right, yeah. I'm um, just wondering, reading about the, the, the no opening constraint, um, yeah. is, that, is that a fundamental constraint or you just put it in? Uh, it's a um, common constraint in most dynamic rupture codes, uh, yeah. but it's, it's, not a, it's not a must. There's a couple of work by Lewis, as you may, uh, may remember, Lewis Dalger, yeah. who looked into this, for example, how to properly treat that. Um, mm -hmm. So you can, you could, it's just, some, I mean, you can just turn it off <laughs> if you want, but then you need to think about how you, what, what you would want to do then with the normal stresses and so on. Yeah. So it's not, um, I mean, it's not, it's just a common, it's just a common, mm -hmm. a common assumption to simplify the problem. Yeah, I can see that being the case for, for transform faults, but I mean, there are many other dynamic rupture scenarios where you could imagine volume change or, I don't know, volcanic tremor. Yeah. So yeah, if, you, if you're thinking about normal, yeah, yeah, this is, yeah. I mean, an interesting application are also surface breaking normal faults, you know, where they, you have these simulations of like flapping uh, yeah. interface, but um, these are done with um, with them course, with discrete element codes, right? Okay. Because in yeah. our case, it's still a wave propagation solver. So the mesh is mm -hmm. not deforming, right? We have displacement and um, we do have static displacements and so on, but it's just, the mesh is not deforming. It's not a. It's not a. It's not a dam code. Still, it's okay. still a wave propagation solver. It's a big problem. If you open, then you have a free surface. So you would have to have a free surface boundary condition and suddenly. But uh, actually, with engineering, um, they have these opening modes. If you if you if you break a cement, you have these opening modes. So that that's once a project got uh, not funded because they said, well, engineers have completely different modes, which is correct. You know, that you need other approaches. Yeah, yeah. So we do. I mean, yeah, I don't have time to talk about this, but we do have yeah, yeah, sure. codes where where we do have opening like yeah. ring cracks and so on on smaller scales. It's not, it's not a fundamental problem in that sense. But if you're in the dynamic rupture community, this is typically um, earthquakes are treated as shear only motion. 
that's the common approach. <clears throat> and if you deviate from that, you can uh, buy the paper, <laughs> basically. Cool. Yeah. Thanks. Um, right. So much complexity lives in this definition of friction. So shear traction being bounded by false strength. So right in state friction, for example, right, then you also solve for evolution of the state variable, which is kind of the history of the age of the frictional contacts <clears throat> um, for geometry and intersections. And we also, I also want to point out, um, this is uh, uh, snapshots of um, dynamic rupture simulation of the Landers earthquake, where we're comparing off-fault um, plastic strain. So we do also get the pool's plastic strain tensor um, caused like by high stresses during earthquake rupture and can compare that, for example, to optim optical image correlations, um, mapping fault zone with or co-seismic damage. It's a very interesting topic at the moment. So this is an old study, but uh, this is really uh, interesting. My children knows about this, so <laughs> I want to put this on. Okay, um, right. This slide is just um, pointing out we're still solving the seismic wave equation everywhere, <laughs> even though you see an earthquake propagating. It's still oh. wave equation just with coupled nonlinear coupled to have, um, an empirical friction law. Also important, um, this kind of um, Dynamic rupture boundary condition is in other methods, not implemented by modulating the uh, numerical flux, but by using, for example, um, split nodes approaches. And they um, do cause quite some uh, challenges numerically, and often you see then um, damping that has to be introduced surrounding this um, discontinuity um, to damp out very, very high um, slip rates. All right. Um, yeah, and our typical workflow for earthquake simulations is something like this. So we have loading of the faults, we can include geology, friction experiments, and we get um, output generated that has, of course, synthetic observables. But we also get, for example, ground deformation that could be linked to tsunami models and um, earthquake physics, everything that happens on these faults. Um, here's just a couple of examples how this can look like. This is um, uh, one of Thomas' models of um, data constraint dynamic rupture model of the Kaikoura earthquake. And what you see are the waves being radiated from um, this complex source. You know, warm colors are particle velocities or slip rate on the fault. Um, and here, what was interesting is that we tried to understand, Thomas tried to understand how um, this cascading behavior connecting dynamically connecting all of these differently oriented segments could be reconciled with what we know about um, yeah, severe velocity weakening friction and a couple of other interesting um, earthquake physics approaches. <laughs> this is another example, um, recent work with a um, group at KAUST, where we, the video plays, yeah, where we're interested in understanding um, the interaction of a damage zone specifically for induced earthquakes with a main fault. And what you see here is cascading slip um, on, I think, 850 fractures. Um, this is an exploding view, so all of these fractures intersect. And um, in this case, I think they're not activating the main fault, but we have other examples where we can model like some of these fractures starting to slip and then activating the main fault, depending on the orientation and things like pore fluid pressure and so on. And this is an, another example, um, it's a paper of uh, Taufik, which is submitted very interested in producing realistic fully physics-based broadband ground motions up to five hertz for the Amatrice earthquake. And here our starting point is um, um, dynamic source inversion. So we can use these dynamic rupture models also to solve inverse problems um, using um, um, MCMC Monte Carlo, a parallel tempering approach. And um, this is the best fitting model from out of a million of um, dynamic rupture simulations to reproduce the recorded strong ground motions of the Amatrice earthquake. And the slip distribution looks something like this. However, due to the computational cost, um, this inversion was only using the low, long, low frequency, long period part of strong ground motion recordings up to a half a hertz. And then what Taufik was interested in is to um, somehow enhance um, this best model from the inversion with what we know about uh, earthquake physics to uh, have a um, uh, physics-based um, high-frequency um, uh, broadband simulation and be adding fault roughness, adding topography, adding attenuation, and um, 
how this looks like is then something like this. So you could get, uh, for example, in terms of the loading, you suddenly get quite a lot of heterogeneity because the fault has these um, non-planar uh, morphology. So every part of the fault gets a little bit of a different um, initial shear and normal loading. Um, you also get kind of um, more um, heterogeneous fracture energy, so friction resistance or how much energy um, of the simulation gets spent into gets consumed into friction into friction, and um, results are quite, um, quite interesting. Um, if you're looking here at the Fourier ac um, acceleration spectra in black is the observation and in red is the model with the rough fault and topography, and we really pushing compared to the models um, from the smooth reference solution in gray, pushing the high frequency content quite a bit. There's still some stations where not matching observations and we think this is related to not having side effects in these models. <laughs> okay, um, it's not all about dynamic rupture. So um, I have, I think, two more slides um, about recent developments purely focusing on wave propagation. Um, one project is that we are involved in seismic acoustic um, simulations. <clears throat> this is an example of uh, we're working with Gregor Hillers in the Helsinki area. And they've had for very small induced earthquakes, magnitude ones, magnitude twos, um, quite loud um, banks recorded in the Helsinki area. And uh, the goal here is to have um, numerical simulations to generate nuisance maps. So not only shape maps, but also come up with um, maps of expected um, nuisance, like loud noises that would dis disturb the population and reduce the acceptance of an uh, um, enhanced geothermal stimulation um, in the middle of the city. <laughs> and um, this is just the first simulation here where we basically have um, yeah, our Earth model, a point source, and we're meshing um, the air layer on top of that. Uh, we have um, new boundary conditions that can couple this sufficiently. And um, I think here we're modeling up to 20 hertz, but ideally we should um, yeah, reach 50 hertz, I guess, at some point um, of wave propagation in the atmosphere. And we're seeing things like topography seems to have little effect on the peak loudness, um, but we see nice correlation, of course, with um, um, poker mechanisms. <clears throat> um, another part is that we've spent some time into um, new implementations of ana anisotropies or different rheologies. So we now, allow, uh, we now have a fully tree clinic anisotropic material supported, um, which is, I think, kind of unusual for an open source code for fully 3D open source code. And we also have a new um, efficient implementation of poor elasticity. Um, basically, all these points are uh, from uh, work of Sebastian Wolf, who's a um, um, computer science student. So these are computer science papers <clears throat> focusing on the optimization parts. But it's nice because there's this full framework in place. We could um, explore, uh, for example, um, yeah, the effects of poor elasticity on different um, combined with kind of kind of complex models. So, for example, in the polar elasticity paper, we see that um, to really resolve um, the slow P wave that's predicted by um, by the bias theory, uh, we we need much higher resolution close to any interface or close to the pre surface than um, we saw in the literature that we would have expected. Okay, so there's all these things. Um, there's also challenges. I want to talk a little bit about um, the implementation before we do the hands-on exercises. I hope you're making some progress in installing Docker and looking at the website while I talk. Um, so specifically this third challenge. So how can we assimilate all of this knowledge, all of this data in a way that makes this uh, simulation suitable for modern software and hardware? <clears throat> and um, here's one example of um, uh, I, I tried to find the most expensive simulation that we're doing. So this is a true earthquake simulation of the Ridgecrest sequence. Um, it's um, basically, I think, 200 seconds of simulation, 3D subsurface, topography, attenuation of plasticity, uh, resolves uh, up to five hertz locally more. Um, and that would be a very expensive simulation costing maybe 170,000 CPU hours on SuperMOOC NG. And if you translate that into uh, monetary cost that's about $320 um, in terms of energy charge, or if you import that to AWS, would be without academic discount $6,500 or two barrels of oil, or um, you could fly from London to Los Angeles for that. Uh, of course, this is machine specific. So if you run this on Shaheen 2, for example, it uses less energy, you can only fly from here to 
um, Chicago. Uh, but it really shows um, something that I don't know if you spoke about this during this course, but it's something to speak about, and that is the um, the carbon footprint or the energy footprint of all of these computational modeling, and why it's worthwhile to invest also into optimization. Or think about the easiest, simplest way how to solve a problem, as Heiner said. And um, this is just a timeline of how SISO developed. So we started with the geophysics version, I guess speed up a bit, um, written in Fortran 90, MPI parallelized using text input and output. And um, we had this kind of first um, collaboration to optimize the code um, to do these um, Landers earthquake simulation. And uh, I highlight something in red, and that is the implementation of assembler level DT kernels. And what this means is that we're basically taking over the job of the compiler um, and have generated code um, that um, is optimized for um, the matrix matrix <laughs> multiplications that we have to do in our ADA DG scheme of solving the seismic wave equation. And uh, that basically means we have customized code for each matrix matrix multiplication. And if you're reading that, it also tells you that, for example, at the moment, um, we are working on the GPU optimization. So this is something that has to be adapted if you're putting the code uh, to run the most efficient as possible to and add the new um, hardware, the new um, chip architecture, this has to be adapted. And the next step, and I want to talk about this a little bit more, um, was the cluster-based local time stepping implementation. And that if you compare these kind of two hero ones that we did for supercomputer supercomputing conference in 2014 and in 2017, you can see that this is not such a large increase in the billion um, billion uh, decrease of freedom. So how many um, how how many computations we're doing? But in terms of the for how, for how many unknowns we're solving, sorry. But it's a huge increase in the amount of time steps. And um, the big advantage here to be able to solve, for example, these kind of simulations on the subduction zone scale was the implementation of um, cluster-based local time stepping. And that means that um, we can also um, efficiently account for um, ill-shaped elements uh, in tetrahedral meshes. Okay, but these are kind of um, hero runs. And normally, um, you will see that you can do something on your laptop and also the kind of production runs are a few thousand CPU hours. <laughs> um, Right, so this is an example um, of doing this on the megatrust scale. So this is the Sumatra uh, scenario of the 2004 Sumatra earthquake. So 1,500 kilometers of fault embedded in a large domain. So we're also interested in modeling the tsunami. Um, and uh, yeah, while the hero run in 2017 took uh, 14 hours on the full supercomputer we had then in Munich, this is now run in five and a half hours on 16 nodes. And we also, and that's something you see in the code, uh, we um, not only optimize the computation part, but we saw really everything from input to output. So we have a geo information um, server um, that is uh, dealing with fast and asynchronous input and output and all kind of other um, optimization. <laughs> okay, but um, another thing to talk about is the grand challenge of meshing. Um, and you heard about uh, Trellis, I have this here, the common tool for hex meshes, um, Gmesh open source meshing tool we will use in the, um, in the hands-on in a bit, also allows hex meshes. <clears throat> and we have um, unstructured tab meshes that Zysol is using in our tools as, um, again, Gmesh for simple models or SimModeler uh, for more complicated models. And uh, these two community standards, they each have their advantages and disadvantages. <clears throat> So unstructured head meshes allows for basically automatized meshing. However, we can have this numerically challenging, bad shaped, ill shaped elements that are called sliver elements. Hex meshes are limited for complex geometries. Um, Gmesh, here's the link, is open source. There's a lot of development in the last years, um, supported by a research group in France, I think. Um, Simulator is free for academics. And um, yeah, the mesh basically, as you will see, we read in as a parallel format and the code does the internal partitioning. <laughs> um, we do use Gmesh in the hands-on later. You can see that we will always start with a kind of a geometry and then mesh it. Um, and this is just a screenshot of how the modeler looks like. One advantage is that you don't have to use the, the GUI for either for neither of them, but the modeler also allows this parallel mesh generation for very large meshes. You don't do that by click and point. This is how um, a sliver element can look like. It's just a screenshot of that. <clears throat> uh, 
Um, this is a slide explaining the impact of these ill-shaped elements on the computational cost. So as you know, um, the CFL condition um, governs um, explicit time-stepping algorithms. And um, if we have something that's common, that's a global time-stepping algorithm, the runtime or the time to solution um, really scales with this minimum um, time step in your algorithm. So one bad element can make your scenario, in the worst case, computational infeasible. And that is what we are um, mitigating by using local time stepping, because the idea is that each element updates with its own time step. And that's um, easy, in principle, easy to implement in a DG scheme, because every you don't assemble any global matrices, every element um, is speaking to its neighboring elements. <laughs> Um, in computational seismology, there's other schemes that implement local time stepping. Um, Spectrum 3D Cartesian has an implementation using um, a Newmark LTS um, scheme. And in ADA, um, we have SISOL, and there's also the Edge code, uh, which is written by Alex Breuer, uh, who's implemented that. Um, yeah, and this is just a, a speed up slide. So basically, um, for this example, which I think is the Sumatra, uh, mesh, we have a speed up by using local time stepping of factor 10 in principle, but then we use a clustered scheme. So it's around seven to eight. It's large. That's a large speed up. <clears throat> okay. Um, I also want to point out um, in other codes that we are developing, we are um, tackling this kind challenge of meshing by not meshing, <laughs> by basically having the code uh, take over the meshing using either diffuse interface approaches or curvilinear mesh approaches. So curvilinear just means that there's a um, yeah, transformation operation inside the code, for example, adapting for topography and diffuse interface or phase field methods um, can use adaptive, dynamically adaptive mesh refinement for following interesting things that happen um, in your simulation while um, you're running the simulation. Let's see what else I have. All right, so now we get into the introduction of the examples. Um, we have two examples that we will go through, one simple mesh, um, with uh, simple geometries. And the other one is uh, a small model um, of the Palu um, earthquake that caused um, a localized tsunami. Um, not surprising because it's a strike slip earthquake propagated very fast, super structure speed, <clears throat> um, that still caused a tsunami. You can see why in, in the example. It was pretty um, quickly clear that this was um, a super shear event. And uh, we also had using social media like Twitter, a lot of information um, relatively rapidly after the earthquake. And this is what we used, um, what Toma used to um, build up um, an earthquake model. So we will see the faults look something like this. They're constrained um, from um, information that we had, also the loading of the faults and the strength of the faults um, and all these things. <coughs> Toma will talk about this a bit more. And then um, in the original paper, we linked this to um, a shallow water and tsunami solver. <coughs> And what we found, and why this example is interesting, is that the earthquake induced movement of the seafloor alone, even though it's a strike slip earthquake, um, can have probably played a critical role generating the tsunami. And there's still a lot of papers and discussion coming out about um, shedding light on the role of landslides and earthquake um, induced um, secondary effects on generating that tsunami. But that was um, our story. Okay. Um, and lastly, I have. Um, what we did for last year's supercomputing um, is that we used the same setup to run fully coupled earthquake tsunami models. And it's interesting basically because it links also to the seismic acoustic implementation. So we have, and this um, in one model, um, these dynamic rupture sources, seismic waves. Then we have a water layer with acoustic waves. Um, and at the top of the water layer, we have um, a boundary condition that allows us to model the gravity wave. So the tsunami wave um, starting, which you just see here starting in this video. And um, that's done via free surface tracking <clears throat> um, using the same idea that um, was published by the group in Stanford. And it's just a snapshot um, how the simulation looks like. Um, if you're interested, I think um, we can talk about this more later, but this is really uh, goes into the direction of multiphysics of simulations with SISO. <clears throat> okay. Um, yeah. And this runs on many supercomputers. Um, quite efficiently. <clears throat> okay, that's the summary. And um, these are the two uh, training examples that we will go through. 
Um, but basically, uh, the take home message um, could be that um, using Zeisler, we can focus on geometrically complicated models with or without dynamic rupture. We have um, support for um, rheologies, different rheologies from pure elasticity with um, complicated um, geometries in the subsurface or topography all the way to full uh, elasticity. We can um, we're really interested in including data in these simulations. So we have the support for um, reading in and also writing large data sets that could be either linked to other codes or they could be used for um, even solving inverse problems or so on or UQ. Um, and um, yeah, basically by investing in this uh, high performance computing optimization, many of these kind of large scale um, simulations are quite feasible even on, a, on an institute cluster because the optimization that we're doing, which is focusing, for example, on, I don't know, Fukagu, which is uh, the fastest supercomputer at the moment in Japan, um, using the same chips that you, you have in your mobile phones. And um, the optimization tickles down all the way to also running faster on the laptop. So that is something important to keep in mind. This is not just um, something to do to be fast on big machines, but there's kind of optimizations really um, fall back all the way to running it um, on smaller machines. Okay, and with this, I stop. I think there's something in the chat. Similar to unrolled loops, yes. We're unrolling the loops ourselves. <laughs> Taya. <clears throat> yeah, cool. Yeah, we did that too in Axis. Yeah. In speed up of factor five or something. Yeah. And then it also means that if you're if you're using Zeisler like with anisotropy or poor elasticity, then you have to um, regenerate the code. <clears throat> yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, any questions? Otherwise, I hand over to to Thomas. I will join you. So maybe just one general one that we can discuss later on. But but we've discussed mm -hmm. this for many years. Um, basically, coupling to to other solvers like you had in the last slide. Um, yeah. <clears throat> I guess, I mean, we've done some of this with hybrid codes, yeah. where you feed in a wave field, you inject them into something else. I guess, <clears throat> in this context, it might be interesting to talk about common interfaces in, in terms of what what needs to be done to interfaces different solvers. And I think SISOL would be really cool. Yeah. With all of the other solvers. Yeah. Yeah, Thomas actually can, can talk to this. We have, we're in a project now in the Geothermie Allianz Bayern. <laughs> we're interested in, in, in coupling to the engineering um, codes of. of building response and they also want that they also yeah. just need to like interface it's a thing once um, you've done it once i think it's pretty easy to do for other calls. yeah yes mm. but we should cool. do this alice um do you know if anybody has tried to use um something like science solve for doing solid earth ocean and atmosphere all together you have solid earth and ocean yeah but... yes <laughs> No, I wanted to do this, but then I caught COVID after Tonga. <laughs> but um, yeah, I, think, the I mean, yeah, when Tonga happened, I thought we should we should do that. But, I think um, it, was, I didn't do it was done more than ten years ago in two D. There was some uh, Martin Kaiser and colleagues have done something in two D a long time ago. But it, it it should work. I mean, yeah, it's just um, yeah, nobody did it so far. That's the question, and that's <laughs> in three D with I saw. But it, there's no, yeah, no need to do, to not do. It. There's no reason to not do it. And I thought Tonga would be the would be the, the thing to do it, even including also also tsunami generation. But um, well, we certainly thought about it too with Ben. Um, not not tsunami, but but the rest of it. So it's a again? perfect example for for Axiom 3D because it's also, an island in an ocean with the symmetry and high resolution and so on. Yeah. So we've we've done atmospheric um, sources on Mars as well, just haven't mm -hmm. done it, but, but but it's basically doable. It's just a meshing yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, for Tonga, then the source representation is really complicated because it's really it's a it's a collapsing a submerged caldera. Mm. So this, I mean, yeah, the source is uh, tricky. And then if you're looking, I don't know if you looked at the teleseismic waveforms, but you see just episodes of uh, of uh, signals. Where it's, yeah, it's very interesting. Mm. <laughs> And then you have also these uh, meteor tsunamis, right? So the atmosphere is triggering localized tsunamis again um, in, the, in front of Japan and in the Caribbean. So. Mm. Hmm. <clears throat> Jared. Yes, thanks. Uh, you showed a few very nice examples of seismic modeling of, uh, in your examples, of kind of large scale ruptures, so for example, because Indonesia. 
Uh, do you think it's also CISO also I see applicable to a much smaller scale? So, for example, a landslide scale. Yes. Yeah, so at the moment, we have quite a lot of. Um, people or users that are interested in modeling small um, induced earthquakes, so magnitude ones <laughs> on this scale. And um, the, um, yeah, so there's no reason to not to use it on smaller scales. For earthquake physics, it poses interesting questions of how you scale certain frictional parameters. That's interesting. But um, otherwise, there's no, no difference in that sense. <laughs> there's no reason why to not downscale it. Yeah, see so who is doing models on the lab scale. I just said that yesterday already. So these are millimeter models, yeah. centimeter size models. Yeah, the, the only thing which I think is, is pretty challenging is that you have, if you if you consider a landslide, you have a few shear plates, of course, which I think is nicely doable with Sisal, as you just presented. Yeah. But there's also, of course, always one side where it's kind of a yeah, kind of normal fault behavior where there is, where where a uh, yeah, kind of uh how do you say yeah where, where they where they separate and they're become there emerges a, a distance in between um right yeah so this is something to keep in mind the mesh the mesh is not deforming in this in this method that is the that is the big thing to keep in mind it's too yeah. so, um, so yeah. shear planes are, are would be nicely uh, yeah would be very or it's also would be really applicable to, to modeling the shear planes but Yes. That, that, that one side where <laughs> where it's kind of coming loose, where there's where, where yeah, I'm constantly searching for the word. Like where, where there's where it's separating, uh, kind of the scarp, that, that's challenging, I would say. Maybe you can map it, right? I mean, so for example, if you have a, a fault surface rupture, you map, I mean you map the displacement and you you can map the, the surface trace and also the damage and so on, but it's just important that the mesh doesn't change. <laughs> so what Tyna said before, right, you can't suddenly um, let it open and have free surface boundary conditions um, yeah. dynamically evolving. So this is just not possible. But of course, you map the displacement and you have the, the surface trace and you have all these things, but it's just not, the mesh is not changing. <laughs> okay, thanks. Yeah. I can send you a link of the of methods that can do this. <clears throat> oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, if there's no more questions, then uh, Thomas? Yeah. <clears throat> okay, so I guess we can uh, start with the hands on part. And I, th yeah, so let's see. Um, so could everyone uh, get the uh, uh, Docker install and uh, pull the latest? Um, this uh, this Docker uh, container. Yeah. Yeah. So hands-on only works if you also speak to us. <laughs> but <laughs> this is a bit uh, difficult. So if you could just unmute and just say yes or. <laughs> well, of course I just uh, installed it, but then I would have to restart my computer, and uh, <laughs> I, I'm afraid I would throw everyone out. So yeah, I'll yeah. do it later. <laughs> <laughs> Better do it yeah, now because there's some steps that could go wrong. Like, for example, this hash that uh, Thomas just marked, <laughs> you have to copy in the browser and things like this. So we're using Docker, but there would also be a, like a, um, uh, a Jupyter lab in your browser that should pop up <clears throat> and so on. So um, yeah, I, I think it's better to take the time now and just restart your computer and come back in. Okay, so maybe you're not thrown out. So shall we shall we do that? Is that okay? So yes, I think uh, it would be good. And then, you know, uh, if you don't finish everything, three that's minutes. fine. Okay. Yeah. Yes, just take your time, um, and okay. because then you know you can just ask us. Okay, you can just so, ask us for everything that goes wrong. Okay, I'll be back. Then, yeah. Okay, hi now. <laughs> so I, I hope the, the the meeting may crash now. I'm not sure. You make me the host. You can make me the host. Well, I have a okay. I'll make you the host too. I have yeah. Yeah. many hosts. Oh yeah. Cool. Okay. Yeah. Well, I. I hold my breath and I. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so in the meanwhile, I can say that. Um, so in this uh, GitHub repository, Sysol training, um, you have everything described how to uh, install this Docker. I mean, yeah, you first install Docker and then you, um, the different steps that you need to, to get it running. 
um, will be described. So basically, it's just uh, at the end we will uh, have a Jupyter notebooks, but uh, within the Jupyter notebook we will run say so. So um, yeah, we just uh, pull the, the Docker container and then we run it, and then when we have run it, then it's outputting something like that. And then you get uh, at the end some link. And you can uh, just uh, follow one of these links and this will open um, Jupyter Notebook. That's what I get. So is there anybody already uh, at this point? Maybe, uh, I don't know, with uh, can I, sorry. Yep. I, uh, for me, I face to open the, the Jupyter notebook, uh, window. So what, uh, what's the problem? Uh, a very useful, uh, error message that says that the page, the, the address is not, uh, reachable. Oh, okay. So for me, uh, only the third link to work. I had the same issue with the first two links and the third link work for some reason. Yeah, I had also a similar uh, issue that first I, I tried one of the links and it was not working, but then I tried others and then I, one of them was good. Yeah, I tried all the links. Ah, okay. <laughs> hmm. Um, I, I experimented with this a little bit, um, with both my, my new ARM Mac laptop and my old Intel Mac laptop, and it will not work on the ARM version. It'll throw an instruction error when you try to run size sol. So if anybody has an ARM laptop, I think size sol won't run. Okay. So I guess, yeah, we can, uh, yeah. I guess we we can note that from for future training, but uh, yeah, we won't be able to fix that. Uh, I think nobody yeah. of us has such a laptop. So maybe <laughs> maybe Jack, you have to have to help us there if you want to want to fix that bug. <laughs> we all yeah, have these, I mean, maybe these I old can machines. Try to rebuild the uh, re like make a new image that's compiled for this. I don't I, I don't know. It's way out of my realm of expertise. Yeah, yeah. Ready. No, the image we can we can. We can we can build, but yeah, we can't compile if we don't have the machine. <laughs> yeah, so I, so basically the problem is that uh, each uh, executable is uh, is specific to a given uh, archi architecture, and so um, yeah, it's kind. It, it won't work with IRM for sure, and yeah, we need we will need to to compile for IRM. So there's uh, this option, but yeah, it's not straightforward to do it. No. You said that. It it works for the um, the Japanese supercomputer. That, that sounds like that's an ARM based supercomputer, isn't it? Yeah, so we just got, we just got access this week, right? So we, but yeah, that's basically the task now of uh, of Lucas, uh, who's not here, is to uh, to compile that. But um, I let him know actually that uh, that you have this uh, problem. <clears throat> no. Yeah. So if if I uh, open the TPB thirteen folder, then I, I get. Uh, a list of file, and uh, I can uh, double click on the Jupyter notebook, and then this will open uh, my Jupyter notebook. So we have a first description of of this um, setup. So uh, TBB thirteen, it's uh, one of the benchmark exercise for um, valid um, verifying sorry uh, dynamic crypto codes. So um, there's kind of a series of benchmark uh, with increasing complexities, and this this can be used to um, to verify that uh, your code uh, meets uh, is like a, uh, gives the same result as other codes. And uh, this one features a, a dipping fault of 30 by 15 kilometers, which is nucleated in the middle, and um, of all plasticity is uh, enabled in this simulation and this result in a, a super shear rupture. And, um, so recording in progress. Yeah. Uh, so there's a first step is uh, to generate a mesh. So for that we use a uh, G mesh. And so, um, 
Yeah, basically you can just uh, run the the full kernel if you if you want. And because um, like the running of the sensor part may take some time, so then if you want to play with the output later on, but then I can later on uh, describe uh, all of these blocks. Um, But yeah, like this, this first line is, um, it just uh, read this uh, geo file, which is an input file for Gmesh and generate a 3D mesh. Um, then um, the output of uh, this uh, step is a MSH mesh file, which is a format of uh, Gmesh. So it's a NASCII file. And we need to transform that to an HDF5, which is uh, typically uh, read by a uh, Saisol. For, for that, we have um, the tool um, which is called PAMGEN. And this just reads the uh, MSH file and uh, create a new um, HTML file. So you can see that once I've, I've run this step, I get um, XDMF file and describe in uh, HDF5. So these two files. And you can see that it's a very small mesh. So we have uh, less than 40,000 uh, cells. And you get also an information of the minimum e sphere, which is important for uh, the time step that you, you will get. Um, and so here is a small uh, small code to just visualize this mesh. So you can see that the, the mesh is uh, the mesh size increase from, from the fold to outside, further away from the fold. And okay, and once we have that, um, so we can directly uh, run SaySol. And you can see on the name of SaySol, of the SaySol uh, um, executable, that it's uh, compiled for double precision and for um, as well uh, ar architecture. So that's why it's not working for IRM. And so you have to set up the number of threads that you use for um, this run. So here we use just a fully open MP uh, scheme. So we, um, because um, yeah, all the CPUs of, uh, of, of the laptop are just uh, sharing the same memory. And so uh, here we use, we can use, uh, well, you can increase the number of threads if you, if you have a, a, a laptop with more, uh, uh, CPUs, but yeah, I have eight CPUs. I keep some of them for um, for Zoom, for instance, and so I, I can just run it, and then uh, it will start running. So you can see there's some information just output it. For instance, that we use plasticity, no attenuation is used um, with a isotropic material, so we could have used also an anisotropic material that uh, the mesh is red. Um, it describes also the, the clustering of uh, the time steps. That is, so you have, uh, for instance, um, the maximum speed up of the clustering, which is uh, 4.5, and uh, the repartition of the um, time step. So let's say uh, uh, you have uh, 500 cells, cells which, are, which have the smallest uh, DT, then 6,000 cells which have uh, two DTs, um, then 10,000, which has 4 DT, 8 DT, and 16 DT. Okay, and, and now you see that uh, um, I've already, uh, so uh, Saisal, I've already completed uh, one second of simulation. So I think the simulation should be around eight seconds long. And you can see some information on the uh, performance, let's say, of uh, this, this rental. It's, yeah, the log is more for larger uh, runs, so it uh, seems very small, but yeah, yeah. A few percent of uh, teraflop that we get. And okay, this will run. In the meanwhile, maybe we can have a look at the um, different parameters that we have. So we have uh, the main parameters file that we call from the executable is, I can open it, it's a, uh, um, it's a file which is composed of a Fortran name list and uh, it describes a different, uh, well, a different part of, uh, of the simulation. For instance, the first one, equation discrete, discrete uh, 
for instance, a material properties or the elastic parameters, or let's say all which is related to the wave propagation part of the code. That here we say that uh, plasticity is enabled. That's there are some parameters for plasticity. And one nice thing uh, is that we can also specify some um, spatially varying parameters. And this is done by uh, calling this uh, YAML file. So the YAML file will descri describe the um, spatial variation of a, of a specific parameter. So we can try to open it. And here we can see that uh, we have the three elastic parameters and two um, parameters describing the uh, rock strengths, which are uh, described here. Um, so here we have just a constant map, which is that we don't have a spatial variation, but spatial variation would be possible. And um, for for all for plasticity, you also need to know the the stress, the stress sensor. So this is uh, described by all these variables. So we have six variables, and this is. Um, Describe in this file, so the, therefore this is include um, for the other uh, YAML file. So if we open the other YAML file, we'll see that we can uh, describe more complex uh, thing that just a constant uh, parameters. For instance, here we have um, mm, well we have some complex formula to describe the variation of um, sigma uh, x x y y z z and other components, depending on, uh, let's say, the position of the point where we want to evaluate. For instance, um, here with this axis aligned cuboid domain filter, we say that in this cuboid, we want to apply this formula, else we apply this formula. Mm. Okay. Then we have. Um, um, Namely, describing the boundary condition, the namely describing the dynamic rupture part, uh, where you can switch uh, between different friction law, that is uh, our uh, fault strengths evolve with different parameters. And um, you have also, again, um, reference to a, a file describing uh, this time the fault parameters, uh, frictional parameters. So. If we open it, we see that we describe, for instance, uh, static friction, dynamic friction, uh, DC parameters, so the slip weakening distance, and the cohesion. So all these parameters, they are described uh, very preci precisely in the benchmark. So we just uh, implement the benchmark with, the, with this file. Um, and then there's other things like um, fault output, description, uh, receiver output, uh, mesh description, and uh, volume output, surface output, which are uh, described in all these files. And you see that the end time of the simulation is eight seconds. So I guess if I go back to my uh, Jupyter notebook, I will we'll see that uh, the simulation is finished. So. Indeed, finish. We, we can see the seismic moment of this earthquake. So magnitude is 7.4. And um, so now we can uh, have a look at the output that we get. So if if I open the output folder, you'll see that there's three file uh, describing the, the fault output and the three file defining the um, free surface output. And then uh, another file display, which is just a NASCII file with the magnitude of the earthquake. So this um, this file can be open with uh, PowerView, or um, here we use directly uh, um, Python to, to dis display this file. So there's uh, this module which is called, uh, what is it? Mm, yeah, PyVista. So we use PyVista to, to plot. So if I, I just run this block, we see that we get an uh, interactive view. So we can select uh, the different variables. So for instance, uh, SRD is a slip rate um, in the deep direction. So, in the, in the, so that is a fault uh, slip velocity. 
and you can just uh, change the, the time to so if I click here yeah, I also see the the scale and you can see that the rupture is propagating uh, from the nucleation region um, and then it it, it reaches uh, the edge of the fold and then it's uh, kind of not yet stopping but uh, yeah there, there's still some uh, wave getting reflected and yeah basically the earthquake is almost over so does uh, anybody was able to run SASOL and get uh, this kind of output? Yeah, good. Um, you should ask who is not able and who needs help. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm afraid that's that. <laughs> it's also not always the same. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, and I, I put a link in the chat. Um, sorry, there's no explanation of these cryptic fields, but there's um, we, we use read the, um, read the docs and there's um, the, the documentation of what these what these uh, variable names mean. Uh, maybe yeah. I had to, is the link in the notebook? I forgot, but it should yeah, be there. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. Okay. I, th no. I think so. Uh, at least yeah. it, it was described. So if, uh... And as you may maybe noticed, we don't write the volume output here. So we have this, uh, it's really much more efficient to just um, get these uh, surface outputs, for example, the free surface of the fault. Um, but um, you can do that. <clears throat> okay, so just, yeah, to follow on Alice. Um, Remark, um, so here yeah, I'm on the main GitHub repository of uh, SASOL. So that's sa GitHub SASOL SASOL. And you can see that there's a, there's a link to this documentation, read the doc documentation, which is quite dense now. Um, and yeah, for instance, if we, I look for output, so you have a fault output here and this all, everything is well documented well, what does all these parameters? And in particular, you see um, that uh, there's this variable output max, which allow uh, switching on and off a different uh, um, variable. And you, you, you have here the uh, name, like the clip, uh, small description of, if, of each uh, variable. For instance, I cell is uh, absolute slip, or let's say accum accumulated slip, or PSR is peak slip rate. Uh, so what you can also do is, um, so here I'm in the, in the output folder, I can just uh, uh, right click and uh, click on download. So I have these three files which have been downloaded. And if I try to open this file, I can, so if you have Parview, so I guess you probably have Parview because you have used it in other um, tutorial. So I just run parview and the name of the file, tpv13 fold. So I, I just run parview and uh, the XMF file. This will open. So then at this point, I, I choose the last um, option, XDMF reader. So not XDMF3 readers. And I get uh, nothing yet because I need to apply on the in the property panel. And at this uh, at this point, I can uh, see the fold. And if I want, I can also um, well, I, I can uh, switch to uh, different uh, variables. So here on the on the at the third uh, line, uh, I can, for instance, have a look at, uh, let's say, the slip, uh, accumulated slip, and I can just, uh, so if I click on this uh, rescale to that data range, so that, uh, again, on the third line, so that, uh, you know, I mean, uh, on my window, it's a fourth uh, symbol, rescale to that, that data range, so you can see, uh, no slip is range between zero and about seven meter, and yeah, you, you can see uh, the slip evolution. So you can play play the slip evol evolution if you want. And 
you can also load uh, other uh well we, we could load the load the surface output if we want so then i'll go back to the gpta lab and i download this file and then i will try to open this file so this is a tpu certain surface xdmf Again, uh, <laughs> so we, uh, should we also quickly talk about the meshing with gmesh or uh yeah can you maybe that's yeah and then um because i, I think we have 23 minutes yeah and then the palu just quickly <clears throat> okay I think yeah. the, the meshing might be interesting Okay, then I, I can, yeah. Sorry. I mean, <laughs> let's finish on that, saying that uh, we can load several uh, objects, and yeah, this would be just a free surface. I mean, it doesn't, I can change the opacity to, to have it kind of transparent. And yeah, and then you, you will just use, uh, let's say, uh, a velocity, and then you, you can see both fault and, and velocity, and yeah, there's many options. Okay, and yeah, so yes, uh, it's true that I did not really follow the structure of the Jupyter notebook so far, but uh, yes, there's, uh, so the mesh is, uh, ooh. the mesh is generated with a, a G mesh, as I said, and it's uh, the, GMesh generation is, or let's say, the, the script. We, we can have a look at the script. Uh, that's a geo file in this folder. Um, and well, we can see that it's quite uh, simple uh, how it is defined because, yeah, basically, the mesh is um, it described by a, a box and a fold. And you have to first define the fold. So here we define the fold. Um, using a rectangle object. So we define it uh, in uh, fault local um, coordinates so far. So that's, uh, so we have different variable here to describe this, um, um, this, this fault patch. So let's say for instance, um, the fault length is 30 kilometers, the fault width is 15 kilometers, and you have also the deep of this fault. Then also you have some, parameters defining the nucleation uh, patch, a square nucleation patch. And um, so with Gmesh, we can then create this uh, this surface object that we call fault and nucleation. We rotate this uh, by the deep angle um, around the x-axis. So at this point, we have just uh, the 2D surface of the, or the 2D descri uh, description of the fault and the nucleation. Then we also have a box object which uh, describes uh, just uh, the volume that we want to, to model. So this is, here you have the boundary, like the uh, variable describing the, the box. And once we have that, we uh, run uh, this uh, Boolean fragment. Uh, option, which just um, make uh, the mesh, um, well, this is a discrete mesh of the CAD model conforming for, um, uh, that is, he, this kind of intersect the fault with the volume and make uh, the discrete mesh uh, of the CAD model uh, consistent between uh, the box and the surface. Then once we have that, we just recover the, the surface. So uh, that is, okay, we say we looked all the surface which are um, in this box, let's say uh, in a box uh, center around zero are um, the top surface. Then you do the same for the fold and you do the same for the rest is the absorbing boundary. So yeah, we have to specify which uh, surface are fault, absorbing boundary, or surface uh, free surface. And once this is done, then we can just um, mesh. And um, once we have uh, set the, the mesh of uh, all these objects, so we have different mesh size for the domain, the fault, and the nucleation uh, 
region. And this being done, we, we have uh, already uh, our match being described. So you can see that, yeah, we have just, uh, I mean, this is a quite simple setup, but uh, this is kind of representative of what we could do with Gmesh. And uh, just uh, a bit more than 50 line, we, we have uh, our uh, geometry being described. Um, okay, so at this point, maybe we can uh, go to the second um, example, which is a more complex uh, example. So it's uh, uh, then uh, course. May, um, yeah, this is a model of the uh, Sula Sulazi um, earthquake that we've uh, Alice presented, and so it's in the Sulazi folder, and it uses a much smaller mesh that we we use in the paper, but still uh, gets quite reasonable result on the fold. So in this case, I can open this uh, Sulavesi uh, notebook. And so here you can see the how uh, look like the fold. So you have three segment, one of them, um, well, two of them crossing the bay, but actually only the blue segment will uh, um, host uh, most of the slip. And uh, so this time the, the mesh is generated with a C modeler, which allow, um, well, it's a kind of com commercial software, but it's uh, free for academic user. And then uh, this allow easily. So we have kind of a well um, uh, developed workflow for generating com complex meshes with this, uh, this tool. And in particular, we can um, generate the CAD model is in the, within the tool and then the mesh. And so here, if I run this uh, this one, then we'll see the mesh. So you, yeah, you, you can see that the, the mesh incorporates some yeah, cost topography, let's say. And, and well, we cannot see the fault on this mesh, but it's there. And, um, yeah, then we can uh, just uh, start running the, the, the simulation again. And this will take um, more time because it's a larger mesh. And in the meanwhile, uh, so in the meanwhile, sh should I describe, uh, show the slides about the uh, 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 generating the full geometry of, of the Palo earthquake? No? Mm, what is the audience interested in? You want to see how to deal with these complicated geometries? Or... Okay. Do, 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 a, do a quick summary. <laughs> okay. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, let me... We will, yeah, we will send, we have a big slide set uh, with like hundreds of slides. We will just send them later. With lots of, we really don't have time to go to. Heiner gave us 90 minutes. <laughs> or Celine gave us 90 minutes, I don't know. <clears throat> okay. Yeah. Starting. Can you see the slide now in the presentation mode? Yeah, okay. So, um, yeah, so here I just present how we build the model, uh, and this model incorporates uh, high resolution topography and also the complex fault network. And so we just would download the, the topography from the Jap Japco website, so we get a NetEDF file, so that's just a structured uh, grid. Um, that, and then we have uh, some Python script which allow um, tri triangulating these uh, files. And so. We have to, so also the, the files which are given, they are given in the latitude longitude. So we have to project also, so we have to, to define, a, to assume a projection string. string. So here we use um, this projection string. And uh, here we generate just a STL file that can be loaded um, from the Jap from the JECO um, read file. We generate a STL file describing the topography. And then we can load that into C modeler. So we have a 
we can import discrete data and we can visualize it on on C Um and there's different uh, options that are on insist on that. Um, then we also create a domain box. So yeah, typically we, we generate the, the box using Gmesh. So um, and we will um, we then import the box into C modeler. So then we have two objects. We have the topography and the box and we can um, intersect this object. So and for that, there's a, an option. Um, yeah, there's, there's, there's a tool in Simodler which allow to make a, to generate a conforming mesh for, from two different objects. So you can see that before, like there's a um, the two mesh does not do not have um, a nodes in commons, and and after so we have a conforming mesh. And when doing that, we can when this is done, we can. Uh, we have then two regions, two volumes, which are uh, separated by the topography. We can remove the top, and then we get a box uh, which account for the topography. Then we have also some tool for generating uh, faults. Uh, for instance, um, this uh, Python script allow um, so it reads uh, fault trace, and um, we have we get, can give different uh, options. For instance. Um, extruding uh, about the extruding direction, about the dip descrip description, which can be constant or varying along strike or along dip, like a list strict fold. And so in this case, we have uh, three different folds, so which are de described by three different uh, ASCII files. We can specify the spacing of the mesh, uh, also how much we want to smooth the uh, uh, the, the input trace and, and the extent of extrusion uh, in both sides to, towards the top or towards the deeper depth. And then once we have done that, we get um, this kind of uh, fold structure in which like the, the folds are uh, popping out of the topography um, because we want to um, in, to have a fold inter intersecting the the free surface. So therefore, we kind of extended the fold also uh, to uh, depths um, or to elevation higher than the topography. And then we just uh, intersect again t this fold with the topography. And yeah, we just this just clip the fold. And then we can just remove the part which is above the topography. And then the model is finished. And so you can see that. With this workflow, workflow, we can uh, really uh, generate complex model with a complex fold geometry and uh, topography, and um, it's it really uh, works well. So, any question about this part? Okay. Mm. So let's see. If uh, my model have run much, no, it <laughs> it's didn't uh, run. Yeah, it, it ran, but uh, very slow. It's I, I just one second of simulation, but uh, let's say we're also at one second. One second. Yeah. yeah. How many seconds are it, supposed to be calculated? It's a uh, thirty second, thirty thirty five second uh, model or something. <laughs> okay. uh, actually, <laughs> we're just going to make it. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's a super sheer earthquake. It's super fast. <laughs> oh, but yeah. yeah, it's a, it's it, it's actually it's 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 not so much smaller than the model we published. So it's actually, I mean, it's supposed to be a real a real case, not a benchmark. <clears throat> it's it's running all on your local PCs or <laughs> yeah, with my, like four cores or so, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. We also have four cores. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so. But uh, anyway, if we we can also just download the data, so there's a data available on uh, at this link. So if you go just after the the block following the the run, you can see there's a, can post a, a link, link. Chat. To, yeah, a link to this data, and yeah. that that we can visualize. Um, so I, I can show you yeah. the, the model on, on. Yeah, let's just have a look at the model and then I think that's good. <clears throat> yeah. And then um, 
yeah, if you, I mean, if you're interested in any modeling, like point sources or many point sources, like you know, called kinematic sources or so, this is also all implemented, but somehow, yeah, the models, uh, the examples we have are um, dynamic WebGL examples, but it doesn't mean <clears throat> that this is all we can do. <clears throat> So, okay. I, so, okay, you you finish up and then we like open up for general questions. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And another point, there's another example in this, in what you installed, that's called uh, Northridge. So that's a kinematic source. That's just um, a bunch of point mm -hmm. sources. So we could also see how this is, <clears throat> how the notebook is um, looking for that one. So a bunch of point sources mean it's a finite source uh, using yeah. the superposition principle. Yes. Okay. And also topography. Can I can I ask um, is is there a, a general format for like finite source implementation? Yes. Uh, you we know, for spectrum yeah. and uh, um, others. So we use the standard rupture format for implementing point sources that has been pushed by um, by Skag and by Martin Mai. Okay. okay. So that will be implemented. can this be used uh, with spectra with the spectrum code? This I don't know. Okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, as and it's certainly something that all like this is something you as are from people that are doing kinematic source inversions, they okay. distribute their models. Yeah. That's another for that. I can I, I post the link. <laughs> Yeah. And uh, may I ask, I mean, this is I mean, you know, it's amazing respect, fantastic, congratulations, such a framework you know compared to what uh, also what you know what was done 10 years ago this is really amazing in combining of course now with jupyter notebooks combining the meshing combining the visualization combining the running it's fantastic it's just a really really major step forward um, of course the students who start now are, are you know not aware of how things were 10 years ago or 20 years ago so really fantastic um how do you how how is this done in in like with sisol i mean you have like one version now that you or a couple of different uh, codes for various rheologies or so how does it how does it work okay so we have a um yes so we have one version um so on the Docker, like it's a fixed version. So it's not uh, like the latest version from the um, GitHub repository. And then we have to kind of pull, uh, push uh, the change, uh, new change to the Docker manually to, to get the latest version. And uh, yeah, when we compile SESOL, we get just um, one executable and the executable may be um, so we have a different executable if we have a different rheology that is uh, if we use um, elastic fully elastic or viscoelastic we have a, we will have different executable or if we use a different order of basis function we will get different executable because everything is uh, kind of uh, optimized for a given scheme. So it also maybe more than for given hardware. I'm sorry. Yeah, also for given hardware. Yeah, yeah exactly. I mean, if you want to fully exploit this optimization, that is mm -hmm. yeah. right. Mm -hmm. But um, it is something that we're interested in, which, which we can't do at the moment, at least with these optimized rheologies, is to have, um, like, to combine different materials in the same model. Like, for example, have um, a poor elastic layer embedded in, um, I don't know, two anisotropic mm -hmm. materials. So at the moment, if you want to have, um, like, a model which has this optimized poor elasticity implementation, we have to specify poor elastic parameters everywhere. You can then, of course, set them in a way that they mimic an elastic material, but it's not. So these kind of um, yeah advanced boundary conditions, for example, anisotropic poor elastic, or you know acoustic poor elastic, or <laughs> dynamic rupture poor elastic anisotropic, and yeah. so on and so on. So this is um, this is something we're currently uh, interested yeah. in. Mm -hmm. That's not 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 super trivial. <clears throat> mm -hmm. ah. Okay, so shall, shall we open up, uh, please, uh, everyone, uh, you, you know, I, I would suggest, unless, you know, you want to show some more things, we open up general questions now to, to Sisol and maybe also to others and also, um, you know, whatever happened in the last three days.
Derek, Alice, um, so do you think that, um, as Taya mentioned, by concentrating more on these, um, like, geological information servers that we'll be able to do, you know, coupling of something like Axis M3D at global scale into yeah. size sole, say, for a local ruptured generator or something like that relatively, yes. like, easily compared to the, the pain that it would take at the moment. <laughs> Yes, I discussed this with Marta some years ago, I, I can, and um, we came up with how to do it, but then we didn't do it. <laughs> so, but it, yeah, it should be possible. I can take out his emails. Yeah. I mean, may I say, I mean, these are, you know, this, these ideas have been around, uh, again, also for a long time, and, you know, call it hybrid, and um, it's always nice ideas, and then it takes an awful lot of time to implement it. To, you apply to one case and say, it works. And frankly, um, we burn PhD projects with this. And then, you know, you, nobody ever is going to use it uh, again afterwards. I, I'm not, I'm not, I may exaggerate, but uh, this is why yeah. my stomach turns around when I think about these hybrid things. You I, don't I don't know. know. The, the question is, do you really want, need to have it um, like online, like fully like online linked, or would it be enough to have, um, to have uh, you know, an, an, an API, like something where you can yeah, that's that's exactly what I was so asking. Like, I know that many people have been burnt trying to make hybrid. You know, it's a huge logistical effort. But if you had a public API to transfer exactly. the yeah. same things yes, back that, and forth, I think that makes a lot of sense because we yeah. have this a lot. I mean, we have a lot of like from the engineering side or people that are interested just get um, output at a certain, I don't know, the full stress state at a, at a at a arbitrary shape boundary and something like this. Yeah, right. I think you may need two time steps or something. Uh, I, I don't know, but or you, the gradients, um, you know, if you could generalize that, let's say for elastic wave fields in a, in, a, in a rigorous way, and somebody, one person spends a lot of time so that like 100 people can do things efficiently, I think, yeah, that would be an advantage, but not one person doing something specifically and then that's it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is it is an interesting problem, but we will always have the situation that we would like to bridge scales, you know, going from a, a, a global into maybe something really more local. Um, so it, it, th th that problem will certainly remain, even though now we have these schemes that, you know, allow combining, you know, meshes at, at, at over orders of magnitude uh, mesh with, with local time stepping and so forth. I mean, and that's maybe a, an, an important point. This, you say, Alice, that local time stepping is involved with, or is implemented with SpecFem. But um, I kind of doubt whether it, uh, I'm not sure, but uh, this is something that works very nicely with the tetrahedral grid, with, uh, with size, yeah. uh, these type of meshes, where the meshing is easy. And you can really go over really one or two orders of magnitude in terms of mm -hmm. um, mesh three size. Orders, yeah, three orders. And, uh, factor, factor and, and, and that has been, you know, a, and it, this is also connected to the numerical method. You know, this this local time stepping uh, and also the, the remeshing that does not work so well with hexahedral grids. It works very well with, with tetrahedral grids and in particular in combination with the DG approach. So it's it's um, dependent on the numerical method. And uh, when what, that was started 10 years ago, this was, you know, really a major advance, um, you know, and probably has not yet fully been fully exploited for, for specific problems. I mean, the local time stepping. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a really, it's a fantastic tool. Kaya. Yeah, still about the uh, hybrid um, stuff, so I, I put a link up. Um, so Marta's paper on this, the idea for her project was that that a lot of these difficulties in linking two discrete solvers are, um, you know, the ones that you mentioned. But but we've done this with with InstaSize, which which really made that a lot easier. So she linked InstaSize with um, Specfem and um, and yeah, this this SWM code. That worked really well. So we've done that for you know having a three D three D box at the source location, at depth, or at the receiver, and in the end, that seemed to be at least in my mind a fairly general framework. Marta actually just flew into Oxford today, and I'm supposed to meet her right now. But <laughs> you can say hi. <laughs> um, to work on her two follow up papers on nuclear monitoring at two hertz uh, for global wave fields, 
coming from these solvers. So I think I think you know if if someone wants to invest it using the Insta size and spec framework or SWM framework it's is really, format, really easy with Insta size. And I think for 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 a size solver that would just be a plug and play as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, that would it's be a very cool. simple problem where you put it at the source location and then just save the stresses and strains and end up being picked up by Insta size. Yeah. So, for example, if you, if you want to verify like one of these optic models using teleseismics, then uh, exactly. you are is translating the dynamic optic model into back projection sources and then putting it yeah for back projection and so on. And uh, yeah, we have a we have like yeah. a, a a dirty link at the moment to Insta size. Yeah. <laughs> And also, I didn't mention yesterday, we have also a paper 2020 with Kundai on, um, he, he wrote this um, Axisim 3D internal hybrid scheme, which is kind of, kind of interesting, actually. It, it takes a local chunk and then, and then moves that to where your, your 3D heter like very strongly scattering heterogeneity is, and then has a background wave field that could be 3D or, or however other complexity. And since we adapt the complexity, you can, you can still sort of model that in a hybridized way. The, the neat thing here is that we can rotate the, the mesh very easily because it's all internal. Um, but in other words, it means that in Axis in 3D, there's also this, this functionality of saving the boundaries. The advantage of that scheme is that it's actually a full long range coupling. There's no one dimensional or one directional transition. I can put that link up too. Mm -hmm. But these these two hybrid approaches, I think they work quite well. I mean, I've been sort of peripherally involved with previous ones that yeah. are painful as well. But. Wow. Remember, tell you when Marcus Trammell tried that. Exactly. <laughs> I do remember. Yeah, it's a pain, but but I think Insta size is is helpful because it's it's a, it's a mesh frame. Yeah, yeah. Um, absolutely. Thing. Yeah. And then yeah, yeah, and then yeah, yeah. the the axis internal one is of course similarly effective because you don't have to mess with two different discrete approaches. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we should talk about it again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Other questions? Well, we, while you pose, you know, think about your questions, I just want to make a comment about the last three days. Of course, this was highly dense, high density stuff, and um, and very short. Uh, but the idea really is to kickstart, you know, maybe to get you started, to get you, you know, you've seen these things, uh, and 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 you can download now and you know kind of get started. And it might be problematic, but you know who the people. Who to contact? What I want to say is that you know you are already a network, you know the spin network and some others, but <clears throat> group together, talk to each other, and if you are interested in one particular approach and more training, this is the place you can demand us. You can get at us and ask, you know, at the next workshop or uh, short course, uh, we would like to have this uh, maybe better, ex more explained or so, and uh, we would like to use SISL, AXSM, Spectrum, what have you, uh, and we would like to have more training. I also say that I've allocated uh, the next winter school, which we do always uh, in, the, in the Alps here, around March 1 in 2023, next year, we had to cancel it. Basically, that program was supposed to be at the winter school, we have only 35 spaces there, but uh, we will. Um, I, I have allocated this again for community software simulation next year around March one. So, again, you can come up to us with, uh, you know, this is something we would like to um, to have more training. For example, mesh uh, mesh generation this, this remains to be a very hot topic. Uh, so that's just an offer for you. So, questions? Comments? Wishes? Lunch. Lunch.